Coming up on this Thursday edition of Daybreak, US Secretary of State John Kerry says no deal was done with North Korea for the release of American detainee Jeffrey Fowle. Washington again calls for the release of the two other Americans held in the North. Korea expresses its disappointment over a top Japanese official's recent criticism of a remark made by his predecessor about Japan's military forcing women to serve as sex slaves for Japanese soldiers in the early 20th century. First Canadian Parliament and large parts of Ottawa remain under lockdown following two shootings that left a soldier and a gunman dead. Daybreak begins now. Hello and thanks for joining us. To our viewers around the world, it's 6am on Thursday, October 23rd here in Seoul. I'm Mark Broom and you're tuned in to Daybreak. Our top story this morning, one of three US citizens detained in North Korea has been released and is now back home with his family. North Korea claims its leader Kim Jong-un personally ordered the release of Jeffrey Fowle following repeated requests from US President Barack Obama Paulie reports. Jeffrey Fowle, one of the three Americans being held in North Korea, was released Tuesday. Without providing details, the U.S. State Department confirmed that Fowle was transported out of the communist country by a U.S. Air Force passenger jet and appeared to be in good health. He later arrived in his home state of Ohio and was reunited with family early Wednesday. The 56-year-old American had been arrested in April for crimes against the state after leaving a Bible in his hotel. While Washington welcomed Pyongyang's surprise move, it drew attention to the two remaining U.S. detainees. We think this is a, a positive step, um, but that does not change the fact that we remain concerned about Kenneth Bay and Matthew Miller. Washington thanked the Swedish embassy in Pyongyang for helping arrange Fowle's release. A senior South Korean official with knowledge of the matter said the move does not appear to be an outcome of talks between Washington and Pyongyang. But the prospect of dialogue between the two foes seems to be budding. Speaking at a forum in Washington Tuesday, U.S. Special Envoy for the Six-Party Nuclear Talks, Sidney Seiler, rejected the widespread view that Washington is insisting on preconditions for restarting nuclear talks. Seiler stressed that the six-party dialogue would have to be first and foremost about denuclearization, but added that it could be demonstrated by North Korea holding off its current nuclear activities. The U.S. official said Washington is willing to listen to North Korea's list of demands and complaints to encourage them to make the right decisions. Seiler, however, pointed out that the main problem lies with the North's unwillingness to respond. Paul Yi, Arirang News. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry says there was no secretive deal involved in North Korea's release of Mr. Fowl. Speaking in Berlin on Wednesday, Kerry said the U.S. is concerned about the remaining American detainees, adding that he hopes Pyongyang will see the benefits of releasing them as soon as possible as well. The top U.S. diplomat also expressed hope for the resumption of denuclearization talks with North Korea, saying that Washington is ready. Kerry added the U.S. is prepared to reduce its regional military presence if North Korea rejoins talks and sticks to its denuclearization commitments. And staying with this story, South Korea has welcomed North Korea's unexpected move, calling on the regime to release the two other American detainees as well. Some experts say this latest development could actually have a positive effect on inter-Korean relations. Connie Kim reports. While North Korea's surprise move is seen as an attempt to better relations with Washington, some analysts say it could also have implications for inter-Korean ties. It would be hard to say that this will have an immediate direct impact on inter-Korean ties. But I see this as a show of willingness to improve relations with Washington with flexibility and in the process it can have a positive impact on inter-Korean ties. The two Koreas are scheduled to hold another round of high-level talks later this month or in early November. 
Seoul has proposed to meet on October 30th, but Pyongyang has yet to respond. And the prospects for talks have been clouded by three cross-border shootouts in less than two weeks. While a Seoul official says it's unlikely for Pyongyang to back out of the talks because it was North Korea's high-level delegation that's agreed to the talks, North Korea watchers don't expect much progress, even if and when the meeting does take place. They say the two Koreas will be coming to the discussions with two very different agendas and interests. So it may be a long way to go from here. But with Pyongyang lifting one impediment to talks between North Korea and the U.S., it remains to be seen whether the regime will continue with its show of goodwill gesture with Washington as well as Seoul. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Now, in other news, North Korea has demanded that South Korea take action to prevent a military confrontation between the two countries. In a statement released on Wednesday, the North said there's no reason not to hold a second round of talks if the South takes appropriate measures to prevent action that could spark off a military exchange. The South has proposed to hold the talks next Thursday, but the North has yet to give its response. Referring to the exchange of fire between the two Koreas early this week, North Korea questioned whether the South truly wants to improve into Korean ties. The North also demanded that Seoul stop activists launching anti-Pyongyang leaflets this weekend, calling it an act of war. Korea and China have lashed out against Japan for denying its forced sexual enslavement of women before and during World War II. Japan's chief cabinet secretary, Yoshihide Suga, said earlier this week that former chief cabinet secretary Yohei Kono's admission in 1993 that the women were coerced into slavery, he said that that had created a major problem for Japan. Seoul's foreign affairs ministry says it was disappointed that Tokyo was countering its previous vow to uphold that so-called Kono statement. Korean officials say any attempt to deny the history would degrade Japan's credibility on the international stage. China's foreign ministry also called on Tokyo to make amends over what it called acts against, huma against humanity. In response, Suga retreated from his comment and said historians need to decide on whether the women were indeed coerced. Now, Korea has not, very fortunately, had a single case of Ebola in this recent uh, global outbreak, but questions are being raised about whether the nation would be equipped to actually handle one if were, one were to occur. The concerns were sparked by the government's recent decision to dispatch medics to West Africa next month in support of global efforts to try and stop the virus from spreading. The Korea Medical Association and Korean Nurses Association at a joint press conference on Wednesday urged the government to remain in close consultations with them over this dispatch. In response, the Korea Centers for Disease Control and Prevention said they were providing high-quality protective gear to government-designated quarantine hospitals throughout Korea and to the medics, of course, who are going to be sent to West Africa. Time now for a look through the international headlines. We're following at this hour. For that, we turn to Eunice Kim, standing by the News Center. Hello there, Eunice. Good morning, Mark. Chaos in Canada this morning. Ottawa police swarmed the country's parliament building Wednesday after dozens of gunshots were heard outside a room where a meeting of lawmakers was underway. Parts of the capital of Ottawa was put on lockdown as police canvassed the area for suspects. Prime Minister Stephen Harper, who was addressing cabinet at the time, was safe, safely evacuated. He condemned the strike as a despicable attack. At least one gunman was 
killed following a heavy exchange of fire. A soldier who was on guard at a war memorial near the Parliament building was pronounced dead at Ottawa Hospital. Two others were hospitalized but are said to be in stable condition. Canadian intelligence agents have reached out to U.S. intelligence agents to probe the identity of the initial shooter. And while there is no motive yet or whether there are other gunmen at large, the attack did come hours after Canada had raised its terror threat level from low to medium. In a separate incident on Monday, another soldier was killed by a hit-and-run attack by a Muslim convert. Earlier this month, Canada announced it was joining the U.S.-led coalition of airstrikes against Islamic State militants in Iraq. And to Ebola now, the United States has announced even more stepped-up measures to monitor travelers from Ebola-stricken countries. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention said it will monitor all travelers from Liberia, Sierra Leone and Guinea for a period of 21 days, the maximum incubation period for the virus. The added measure will launch on Monday, initially in six states, before extending to others. This as President Barack Obama's newly tapped Ebola czar Ron Klain started this post on Wednesday. The WHO also convened an emergency committee meeting in Geneva to discuss whether stricter travel rules were needed, particularly in border areas. This as the group released new Ebola death figures, which spiked by 322 in West African hotspots over a five-day period. A curfew is in place in Sierra Leone town of Koidu after two people were shot dead there in a riot triggered by attempts to place an elderly woman under quarantine. Sierra Leone's government estimates more than 20 Ebola deaths every day in its western regions. Shifting now to the war against the Islamic State group, Iran's leader has vowed to support neighboring Iraq in its battle against the radical Sunni insurgency. The pledge came as Iranian President Hassan Rouhani hosted Iraqi Prime Minister Haider al-Abadi on Tuesday. President Rouhani said Iran has supported Baghdad from the first day and will remain on that path until the last. According to Iran's official Irna news agency, that comment was followed by support from the country's supreme leader, Ayatollah al-Khamenei, Khamenei, who said the security of Iraq and Iran were inseparable. The Islamic State group has captured large swaths of territory in Syria and Iraq, including the majority Iraqi city of Mosul, threatening to expand toward the capital of Baghdad. Meanwhile, in Egypt, a bomb exploded outside of the country's most prominent university on Wednesday, the second such explosion near Cairo University in six months. Egypt's interior ministry said 10 people were wounded, including six policemen, after the bomb was apparently detonated following clashes between Islamist students and police. Universities have been a frequent site of violent protests since the military's ouster of Islamist President Mohamed Morsi last year. We start before the sun rises to bring you the latest stories out of Korea. We also lead the way with important global coverage. Stay on the pulse of what is happening with Daybreak. The global economic recovery remains beset by downsized, downsized risks, even all these years after the 2008 global financial crisis. And with signs China's economy might be slowing down, finance ministers from the Asia-Pacific region got together this week to coordinate their fiscal policies. Sean Lim reports. 21 finance ministers from the Asia-Pacific region gathered in Beijing to coordinate monetary policies in a battle against increasing downside risks to the global economy. And it seems it came at the perfect time, just a day before the APEC meeting. China announced its slowest quarterly GDP growth rate in five years at 7.3 percent, banning concerns that the world's second largest economy is becoming a drag on global growth. However, China's vice premier Zhang Gaoli stressed full confidence in the Chinese economy and said performance was still within a reasonable range. Nevertheless, he still called for deeper regional cooperation to stave off the downward pressure being exerted by the world economy. 
The Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation must effectively shoulder the important mission of promoting regional and global development that features policy coordination, growth linkage and interest integration. Korean Finance Minister Che kyung hwan also called for APEC member states to coordinate their macroeconomic policies in a more cautious and transparent way. At the end of the one-day meeting, the ministers issued a joint statement agreeing on implementing flexible fiscal policies to respond to short-term unevenness in the global economy. And it also said nations should advance structural reforms to spur new sources of growth and jobs. All sides reiterated that they should implement appropriate microscopic economic policies to support economic growth and create jobs. At the same time, all sides committed to further promoting structural reforms and to take necessary measures to solve bottleneck issues and the weakness of the current economic development, releasing new power for the sustainable economic growth. With the impact of the global financial crisis still reverberating through world economies, leaders will continue the discussion at the APEC annual summit meeting in November in Beijing. Sean Lim, Arirang News. Korean importers' use of the Japanese currency to settle deals have dropped to a record low in the third quarter of this year. The Bank of Korea said the yen accounted for less than 4% of all import deals in the July to September period, dropping half a percentage point from the previous quarter. Although the uh, central bank declined to comment on the reason, industry watchers say it shows Korean traders' reluctance to pay with the Japanese yen due to the weakening currency. The U.S. dollar was the most favoured currency when settling import deals, accounting for nearly 85% of the total. Internet giant Yahoo has beat market expectations in its latest earnings call, posting nearly $1.1 billion in revenue for the third quarter. The web portal operator said this week that its revenue rose 1% on year for the third quarter. Yahoo got its biggest boost from its sale of Alibaba's IPO shares, that worth around $9.5 billion, along with record growth in its mobile ad business. Now, despite the strong financial report, Yahoo continues to lag far, far behind its main competitors, Google and Facebook, this comes as the veteran tech firm seeks to win back its declining market share amid a major restructuring of its global offices. Now, another trend in the IT sector is wearable technology. And it's fair to say, though, that uh, smartwatches and the like have yet to really set the world alight. And this has left analysts wondering whether wearables have become the victim to their own hype or if it's still early days and the boom is yet to come. Gwonsoa reports. There's been a lot of hype about wearable technology, but for most consumers, it's yet to make the leap to must-have gear. However, market watchers believe it's just a matter of time before the boom begins. Leading professional services network PricewaterhouseCoopers in a recent report forecast sales of some 130 million wearable devices between now and 2018. It says 53 percent of so-called millennials, those between the ages of 18 and 24, are excited about the technology. PwC suggests six industries will see the greatest benefits from the rise in wearables. Entertainment and media companies are expected to be the big winners, as the report says, where there's a screen, there's an opportunity. It might not be a revolutionary new genre, but analysts say it improves what's already there by enhancing the fun factor. This factor plays right into the gaming industry, which will go beyond touchscreens and incorporate other senses into the experience. The healthcare sector is also expected to reap benefits by developing more devices for consumers to monitor themselves. Social media, advertising and retail businesses are also forecast to ride the wearable tech wave for profits. So the forecast seems bright, but the industry does face some obstacles. While the report says one in five U.S. adults already own a wearable device, it also revealed one-third of them didn't use it very often or even at all. 
Analysts say the biggest challenge the industry faces is convincing consumers their wearable device is something they can't leave home without. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. And a good Thursday morning to you all as we kick things off with Game 2 of the Best of Five first round series between the LG Twins and the NC Dinos, which was finally played after two straight rainouts. So let's take a look at the highlights from Mazhan. Now, of course, leading off in the top of the first inning, Chung Sung Hoon deep to left field. There it goes. A leadoff home run gives the LG Twins the early 1 0 lead. Fast forward to the fourth inning, Brad Snyder with a man on deep to straightaway center, and the LG Twins now take a 3 0 lead. Now stays that way until the seventh inning when Eric Thames with the first pitch he sees gone and the deficit is cut to 3 to 1. Next play, E. Tail one at bat and he's got a single to right center here. Scoring is E. Ho Jun and it's now 3 to 2. But despite the late rally here, that's all the scoring for the NC Dinos as LG adds an insurance run in the ninth, take a 2 0 series lead with a 4 2 victory. And staying in baseball, but over to Game 1 of the 2014 World Series between the Kansas City Royals and the San Francisco Giants. Now, Giants off to a great start in Game 1, jumping early against Royals star James Shields as they scored three runs in the first inning, including Hunter Pence's two-run shot. Now, the Giants lineup would score five runs off of Shields in his first three innings of pitching as the Giants starter Madison Bumgarner has another great postseason game, pitching seven innings, giving up just one run on three hits as the Giants take game one seven to one and a one nothing series lead. And now shifting over to the 2014 Incheon Asian Paralympic Games. After dominating in the bowling competition, South Korea dominated in the team lawn bowling event this time as the nation added two gold and three silver medals in the team lawn bowling competition on Wednesday. And now with that, we're going to move over to some Wednesday night's KBL action this time. Chunju KCC Aegis continues their hot streak, beating Busan KT Sonic Boom 78-74. You want to take a look at the defending champions Ursan Mobis Phoebus take on Wanju Dongbu Promi. Now a tight game from the start as Mobis takes a slim 18-17 lead after the first quarter before breaking it wide open in the second quarter to take a 40-30 lead going into halftime. Now Mobis led by Moon Tae Young's 22 points and 10 rebounds never look back as they cruise through to win this game 72-61. Now with South Korea's success in volleyball during the Incheon Asian Games, the fans have been flooding the arenas to watch the V-League this season. So let's finish things off with some Wednesday night's V-League action, starting off in the Women's League, where the IBK Altos took on the defending champions GS Cartex for a repeat of last year's championship series. And just a year later, a completely different result as the IBK Altos completely dominate GS Cartex in this match, led by IBK's Destiny Hooker and her 27 points. As IBK takes this match 27-25, 28-26, and 25-22 for a 3-0 lead. And meanwhile, over on the men's league, Hyundai Capital Skywalkers taking on Woody Card Hanse. Oriol Kameo puts up a game-high 20 points, but Hyundai Capitals Moon Sung Min and Liberman Algamez combine for 34 points as Hyundai Capital sweeps through three sets to nothing. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. Good morning. According to the traditional East Asian calendars, today is Sanggang, which literally means appearance of frost and descent of temperatures. And daily lows have surely dropped to the cold side. And many parts of the Indian regions will see the frost this morning as the nation is waking up to chillest morning of the season. But the sun will be sticking around all day long and the highs will be gradually increasing as the day goes on and readings will be similar to yesterday. So we'll uh, surely notice the big temperature gap today as the low in Seoul kicked off at 6th and 
Sunday daytime highs will be reaching to 19, while Daegu and Busan will be rising to 20, and Gwangju will be topping out at 21 this afternoon. Now, for other regions, Jeju Island will be making to 18, while Daejeon and Dukdu will see highs of 19 and 16, respectively. Well, it's very chilly out there, so be sure to dress warmly before heading out today. Well, that's all for Korea, and here's international weather for viewers around the world. Well, that's going to do it uh, from us for now. Have a great day and a great weekend. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.